We are absolutely delighted to welcome Robin Card Harris to the show today. Welcome, Robin. Thank you. Nice to be with you both. I've uh, been a huge fan for many, many years, uh, reading your papers and following along and uh, been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. Uh, there's a um, there's a sense that I have that uh, with your background, um, not just deep in the neuroscience of, of psychedelics, but also uh, a kind of psychodynamic psychotherapy background, uh, you're uniquely positioned to, to talk in, about the integration of different uh, aspects of, of healing and wellness. Um, and so um, we, uh, we have a lot of burning questions for you. Um, first, I, I wonder if you'd be willing to describe for us, um, I believe you were in your master's program when you got interested in mm -hmm. The question, and this comes from your TEDx talk when I was uh, researching and getting ready for this, that that you were uh, wondering, is there a drug that could help reveal uh, the depths of the unconscious mind? Yes. What led you to ask that question? Is there a drug that could do this? Yes. Well, I suppose I I don't know if I if I knew it was psychedelics. Um, you know been a, a while uh, doing doing the the masters in psychoanalysis i was in my mid 20s i think um and it, funnily enough uh, it it had been a while since i'd personally encountered psychedelics let's just put it that way so they weren't really on my radar um and uh, i'm not sure i was consciously thinking <laughs> psychedelics but maybe unconsciously i intuited psychedelics and uh so you know i was thinking well you know drugs change consciousness if the unconscious exists it stands to reason and that actually felt like a legitimate question if the unconscious exists i was studying psychoanalysis but you know everything felt so flimsy um in terms of evidence for the sort of central a sort of phenomenon in a way of, of psychoanalysis, uh, the existence of the unconscious mind. And uh, I just thought, you know, well, alcohol makes you sloppy, disinhibited. You do some things that you wouldn't do ordinarily. But does it reveal the unconscious? Well, I don't know, in the sense of instinct being released. Meh. It's not, it didn't feel compelling. And and so I, it was intuition, I think, and and it must have been because I would have put in a library search with the term LSD, I think, in the search, and there it was, you know, directly in front of me, realms of the human unconscious, you know, Stanislav Grof's book, um, and uh, that that was it, you know, it was like yes, <laughs> there's something. There's something to this. And then, you know, committing and changing, actually, the master's program that I was studying from something boring like experimental psychology or some run-of-the-mill kind of cognitive psychology master's program and taking that, it felt like a slightly reckless, but something I had to do to change uh master's course i was formally enrolled on this this you know experimental psychology i might have been applied psychology um and then changed to psychoanalysis and contemporary society was was the master's program it, it um required a bit of a, a you know a leap of faith um and and so i had to feel like i in a sense, was justified in doing it. And then maybe something was going on where, where I was thinking, well, I'm hearing about all this fantastic stuff, totem and taboo, like crazy, crazy ideas, and a lot of fun. But is it true, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, does, the, does even the unconscious exist? And then once I found Stan Groff's book, I just, and, and he's saying things like laboratory, with LSD, with psychedelics, we have uh you know laboratory evidence for central tenets of 
psychoanalytic theory, I just thought, yes, yes, solid ground. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> it makes sense given um, what I know, which is not a lot, but um, reading LSD psychotherapy, uh, the, the the incredible uh, journey that Dr. Groff had from Freudian analysis, uh, traditional uh, Freudian analysis, and attempting to do that with with LSD and sitting behind the couch and finding out pretty quickly that he needed to innovate, um, that, that, that would, that would be a, a really useful kind of, uh, maybe not mentorship, but, uh, a signpost for you to follow in terms of that transition and your thinking. Yeah. Yeah, it was. And, and, uh, just how, 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 yeah, how deep it goes and how that then took him on to, you know, a more Jungian perspective and then his own, um, perspective inspired by um what is it otto rank and, and birth trauma um and uh, yeah how, how that um you know led to the manifestation of of his kind of cartography of 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 the unconscious um yeah it was uh yeah you know and and um in terms of what is the unconscious like nailing it down you find that it's it's a bit of a what's the right word do they call it a chimera anyway it's slippery you know it's you think you've got it and then it's gone and and part of the realization for me i think over time is that it's it's a it's a vague phenomenon a vague construct and such things exist in science that that's not a cop out it's just it means that you know, a thing can be maybe, maybe you know, two things at once, or or not so crisply differentiated whether something is memory, say, or fantasy. Um, and so, I, I these days, that's how I see the unconscious that it's sort of intrinsically dynamic and abstract and it's it can never really be nailed down so you know universal themes that are true in, in everyone like something like the oedipus complex you find that it just it doesn't hold up you know it's it's not right. too absolutist but as a interesting theme that plays a role in the human condition yeah it's 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 interesting yeah well, I'd like to um, to fast forward to your early work with psilocybin and imaging, and uh, you you published a paper where you you had a, a really interesting and I I hope people listening to this podcast know what I'm referring to. If not, you can go find it in PubMed. But an interesting diagram of kind of ordinary consciousness and the level of communication between different uh, brain regions. And then uh, the level of communication or the diversity of different communication pathways on psilocybin. Mm. And um, <clears throat> I'm curious about whether you were surprised by the finding that that came forward from that work. Not really. It, in it was a bit of you might even say it was a bit of a positive test strategy in the sense that the idea, the hypothesis was strong. And uh, and so we came in and I, yeah, of course. And it was in the early days of the birth of this entropic brain idea. And uh, I was going to physicists or mathematically minded people who have the skills because I don't. I, I need to do that kind of thing through collaboration. Um, but I would say that there's I have this intuition that um brain activity becomes more rangeful, more diverse under psychedelics. It just stands to reason that it should. How can we look at that? You know, and this um this measure uh of of entropy um I think is interesting. How how can we apply this? And uh and then the clever people go off uh, in this case it's um it was um uh, Dante uh, Chialvo, um, Argentinian um, physicist uh, with a keen interest in criticality, self-organization, um, 
and uh, um, a I think at the time a PhD student he was supervising Enzo Tagliazuki, another um, Argentinian, and and together we collaborated and produced that that work. Um, and over time, it's just been reinforced in in a number of different ways, such that it. I think it's a really useful principle, the the entropic brain one. We often, you know, are, are sort of talking about it in our research and um, still seeing it, um, finding it difficult to find sort of anomalies to the rule. Um, uh, so it's pretty solid. Um, and these days, actually improving some of the measures as well. Um, so that it's an even more reliable readout. And just to say it plainly, the entropic brain principle is that uh, the if entropy is an index of the unpredictability of a phenomenon, like a system over time. That it that it if it's disordered, for example, it's, it's harder to predict what it's going to do next. Um, like a molecule in a gas, rather than a a solid structure like ice where it's just you know where it is you know mm -hmm. um and so um the idea is that if uh, if you can index within a range uh within a range of disorder if you want if you dial it up in parallel you'll be dialing up the uh the diversity i call it the richness of conscious experience that it be more rangeful as you as you dial it up in parallel with what's going on in the brain and that would translate typically also into a diminished sense of assuredness about things um and it seems to hold up it seems to hold up mm -hmm. and and for our audience um i'm wondering if you could connect this entropic brain um sense with what people often talk about now it's part of um thanks to you and others the default mode network has become part of the sort of conversation about neuroscience and about um depression and ocd and even schizophrenia and so forth like uh, what is what is your sense how would you describe in kind of uh lay terms uh the role of the default mode network and it's um its place in mental health and and what we should know about that yeah well the default mode network has it's sort of entered um uh people's consciousness and it's sort of taken over from hemispheric differences in a way it's something that people can get a, a handle on about the brain um and it is it does seem to be an important network in the brain and some reasons why it's important it has um, disproportionately high metabolism and blood flow and connectivity. Um, and uh, it's involved in brain development ontogenetically, so within our lifetime and also evolutionarily. Um, it's involved in particularly high level um, psychological functions like what's called mental time travel, imagining mm. the past and the future, uh, the opposite of mindfulness in a way, <laughs> the opposite of being present-centered, so daydreaming, um, and imagination, fantasy, you know. So um, uh, it's, uh, it seems to be part of a pattern of distributed brain regions that may even be human-specific or disproportionately expanded in our species and also there's a ton of serotonin 2a receptors which is what psychedelics work on i would say these days the only qualifier uh, to this rule that oh, the default mode network is interesting particularly interesting in the context of psychedelics is to say that it's just is not just about the dmn the default mode network it I, I, these days I say DM, think DMN plus because there are other um, very expanded cortical regions close by um, that seem to be uh, 
at least as important as the default mode network. And actually, these days where I think in 2010, I'd written this paper with Carl Friston, um, uh, inspired by early kind of schooling and reading and psychoanalysis, you know, default mode network is discovered, you could say, in 2001. Marcus Rakel has this famous paper on it. Um, and, uh, you know, so it was a hot topic. And I thought, ah, could that be the ego, you know? And, and so I'm looking at brain imaging studies saying that it's activated, especially during sort of tonic, um, you know, cognition, sort of offline, introspective, ruminative. Um, and I thought, yeah, yeah, you know, and then looking at some of the regions that engage during sort of suppression of of thought, like the medial prefrontal cortex. And I thought, ah, oh, ego functions. And um, but these days it's sort of it's more in the brackish water, I would say, between I mean, and this is a, a, a bit of a dangerous game to be playing, but you know, putting modules onto constructs like the ego and the unconscious. But I would say that the DMN is more of in the brackish water, the space between the interface between the unconscious and the ego, you might say. Um, if you think of things like, you know, fantasy and imagination, is that really ego? Where where does ego end and unconscious begin? Um, yeah, so, and actually there might be other uh, parts of the brain, systems in the brain that are more involved in what you might more classically call ego functions, um uh yeah um so i would say you know take ideas like that with a pinch of salt in a sense you're always learning as you go on <laughs> but these days i, I yeah. tend to think you know uh it's more about sort of default mode network plus and yeah okay. there's some interesting stuff in that direction and speaking of brackish waters uh and the uh, and the space between, um, what is your what is your current sense of where the self ends and where other begins, uh, in this kind of fuzzy gray area between uh, the individual, the the sort of the I and the uh, and the the other. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this recently came up in the context of. Um, thinking about some of Carl Friston's work and how it might be used to make sense of entity encounters under DMT. You know, that substance in particular seems to have become associated with, and we've seen it empirically in our work, you know, about 40, 50% at a, at a moderate to high dose of DMT, we give it IV, will report these the sense of presence sense of otherness and 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 that's where the otherness en entered my consciousness that you know is is the dmt experience quintessentially one of ego dissolution well maybe it's a big feature but is it you know is it really a dominant feature ego dissolution as such is that what people say when they come back you know mm. And 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 probably more. There's this sense of otherness, this other consciousness, other intelligence in that space. And so I think there 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 is where where there's anything that we talk about and have names for, they have some degree of separateness from other things. You know. So I think there there is something at least in normal waking consciousness and in consciousness generally, uh, that's different about other to, to self. Um, but of course, the unitive experience where there is a um, disruption of, of ego boundaries uh, and the sense of self and other collapses is, um, is, is that, you know, that it, fascinating case where um the separateness between self and other breaks down um but um yeah yeah and 
I mean, some of our work most recently, Leo Roseman, a postdoc in in our team at Imperial, um, has done some really nice work on um, Israelis and, and Palestinians drinking ayahuasca together and um, how they talk about otherness, you know, and how the otherness there in that classic, you know, geopolitical, religious conflict is is a problem and you have the polarization of course all the conflict there um and uh what uh, came out of these interviews he did with with these mixed groups of of arabs and jews drinking ayahuasca together was the appreciation of otherness you know it wasn't mm. it wasn't just all themes of shared humanity were all the same Mm. It was like, oh, your culture is actually really interesting. Mm. And, mm. Oh, isn't it interesting when I hear you sing in Arabic? It provokes me. Mm. And I've been, I've been sort of taught through circumstance and uh, so on to hear that as bad and an enemy. And, and, mm. and actually, it's, it's rich and beautiful and fascinating. Mm. You know? So I thought that was interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah, much more nuanced than just the the melting away and the unitive experienced. Yeah, mm-hmm. interesting. I, I I've been wanting to ask you um, about I I recently heard Roland Griffiths interviewed uh, talking about, of course, psilocybin and psychedelics. And and one thing he said uh, in the interview was that he believes that in thirty to forty years. We're going to look back at psychedelics and say these were a crude tool that um, pointed us toward what he think what what he suggested in the interview is that there may be technology coming that would uh, be able to um, create uh, and maybe I'm reading his in too much into what he said but perhaps create mystical experiences or create psychedelic experiences in a more controlled um, and precise uh, way and. I, I just was, I was curious if you um, have the perspective that we're right now for the time being um, working with cruder tools that later on will be refined as we develop our understanding about what it is about psychedelics that are so, uh, that's sort of like what's the crucial uh, mechanism or, or ingredient there. Mm. Well, it's a fascinating thought to think 30, uh, 30 years a- ahead and whether we would think that. Sorry, I just got the sun in my eyes. So. Yeah. <laughs> Done. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, deep, deep brain stimulation, for example, or, or, or trans, uh, trans, um, cranial, um, magnetic stimulation, TMS. People would refer to as uh, blunt tools, quite crude, um, and drugs, of course, it, you know, chronic medication drugs that are, in a sense, so sort of, you know, dirty in their action. They're hitting everything. There's there's a lack of precision there. Um, oh, yeah, would we see psychedelics as blunt tools? I mean, the drugs themselves, yeah, but the psychotherapy is such a key component of it that right. it, it, you would have to say, oh, we would have a an intervention to do what the drug does, which introduces, you know, a hyperplasticity and an openness. And so we wouldn't need the psychedelic drug to do that. And then, you know, we might have some kind of, uh, gosh, like ultrasound, I, I don't know, something that isn't a drug that is maybe more precise and maybe like a flip a switch and it, it comes on. There's no anticipatory anxiety necessarily. You just you're just in, you know. And then when you want to come out, you can, you know, dial it down as fast or slow as you want. I mean, that would be neat. But technologies like um, ways of yeah, ways of delivering the drug with a a drug with a short half life. A lot of these psychedelics have that DMT, five meo. We can do that, you know, with things like continuous infusion and steady state. Mm. And then you want to turn it off, you just stop the infusion and it's a fast, fast metabolism and you come down. So, um, yeah, could that be done without the drug? Well, of course, well, not of course. Well, it could conceivably, and that's an interesting thought. But uh, 
uh, I, I, you know, what the future entails for psychotherapy, the idealist in me thinks that you always need a human being, there, you know, with the other human being, being human beings, you know, <laughs> at the same time in space and time and um, and that being a crucial component. Sure, you know, digital tools will help. Um, and uh, I'm a believer in that. I'm involved in a, a startup around that, but it's it's not for replacing human beings. It's just for supplementing in the way that technology does. Um, yeah. yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, we're we're in the question here as we develop our psychedelic therapy training of uh, the hybrid model of how much can be done online and how much needs to be done in person for for similar reasons um there there there's an advantage of being able to train more people online but obviously there's a huge disadvantage of not uh feeling the you know the heart rate variability impacts on the other person and the uh, all of the things that happen um energetically in the room uh in training so yeah. it's yeah. going to be interesting yeah but there is huge scope. I mean, even you know what's going on in one's physiology. <laughs> you, could, you could you could have that recorded and 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 fed, you know, in real time, and you can see what's going on. And so there, there I think it, it usually pays to be brave about where things are going and how it could help. And these things tend to happen whether you like it or not. You know, if they can happen, um, but. Uh, I mean, the extreme of it is some kind of robot shaman just to sort of play on on provocative terms and archetypes. But um, I don't know. I don't know about. I don't know about that really. Um, yeah. Um, well, it seems like uh, first things first in terms of um, taking yeah. psilocybin through phase three, and maybe that's uh, maybe that's the first. Uh, are we? Where are we in that in the arc of, <laughs> of psilocybin? and uh clinical yeah, research yeah it depends how you look at it you know what what the model is if it's some um, sort of um national and international approval through regulators with psilocybin it's not as close as it is with mdma therapy for ptsd which uh you know maps are, are gunning for um 2023 of course um so how close is it uh and and I don't think anyone really knows. Um, could I mean best case scenario twenty twenty four, but you know could easily slip on, easily slip on, um, and so we'll wait and see. But that is the is the sort of um, mainstream medical model with like FDA approval for a given indication, maybe treatment resistant depression could be major depressive disorder. Um, uh, but then you have these other um, routes like the Oregon model um, and now California um, moving in a similar direction and likely elsewhere. It's moving so fast, it's hard to keep on top of it all. But that model is very interesting and that's looked set to be the first mover in terms of some sort of infrastructure level change, even though it's not national. It's it's still a big change and requires rollout and it's regulated. Um, and so that I think that's a fascinating model um, to watch and, and the plans, the roadmap is for that to open up in Oregon in 2023. Um, the, the people being treated, whether they're patients or, or even healthy people. Um, so yeah, I, I guess let's watch this space. A lot's going to be happening in 2023, it seems. I'm wondering if we um, we kind of went uh, bottom up in terms of a lot of constructs that kind of might um, lead into a bigger conversation of just what the human mind is uh, and how you're framing that in your yourself these days and how you approach research in terms of what are you really going after in terms of understanding the human mind and um, 
I'm assuming there needs to be some working definition of the human mind as you're exploring it and how all these different networks we're talking about and then psychoanalytic concepts and, uh, you know, and then methods of action and how you just think about the mind as a, as a mm -hmm. kind of larger construct. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess coming into this space, I, I, I never, um, wanted to hold a particular philosophical view on on the mind or the mind and the brain or even yeah i just sort of went with the flow and it's only in time that you realize oh you do have a particular perspective and and part of this has become uh clearer to me as we've started to become or we've started to try to become a bit more precise in making mappings between brain activity and experience and um and, and part of the endeavor there is to try and do it dynamically so you know the psychedelic state has never been one state and it's it does it a huge disservice to even call it the psychedelic state neural correlates of the psychedelic state of course i'm you know guilty of, of that that was the title of one of our papers but and so the point is that we can do much better than that. And, and can we look at psychedelic substates, substates and what they look like both experientially or how they're felt, how they're experienced and what, what uh, mirrors those experiences in terms of brain activity. And when you go in, in that direction, you realize that at this time in history, uh, these are different domains and we're, uh, making mappings between these domains and that's where we are so there is an essential kind of pragmatic dualism in a way to this endeavor and i'm i'm quite sort of um yeah accepting of that at, at this stage i think for some cognitive neuroscientists they feel that it's uh somehow a cop-out or weak science to to um not just see everything through the lens of the brain but i just um yeah i mean ultimately could we get there i don't know i'm a bit doubtful about whether we could i mean the domain of experience of meaning is always the domain of experience and meaning how could understanding the brain in a more complete way ever sort of collapse all of that or make it just redundant I just don't think it ever could. Um, so that I think there probably would always be this essential dualism there. Um, but uh, anyway, these days uh, it, I'm very interested, and, and this is what I hope to do at UCSF, moving to UCSF uh, uh, formally on the 1st of July and then in person in, in August. Um, but this is part of the program of research that we want to carry out there is to try and drill down into psychedelic sub substates uh, find reliable correlates of different dynamic experiences like the entity encounter uh, like um, bliss states profound bliss states what about struggle under a psychedelic you know looping struggle that you can see during you know periods of, of particular distress and, and 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 psychological challenge what about sudden insight um what about cathartic release you know uh, what are the correlates of these experiences how can we decode them um and then perhaps even detect them in the brain and body uh, through recordings and, and, and perhaps even do that in real time. And that would be useful. You know, this is where technology could aid, you know, the guides of the future because they could, they could see this readout and think without having to, you know, blunt tool, <laughs> uh, nudge someone or, or check in with them and say, where are you? Which can be disruptive. Mm -hmm. It could also be good, of course, but it could be disruptive but know that someone is gravitating into a, into a distress state or a struggle state, and then at least have that information, you know? And, and that feels entirely possible 
Mm. That kind of scenario, yeah. Do you contextualize... Well, I'm curious about about the way you're contextualizing some of the more, what we would call in transpersonal psychology, um, well, let's call it expansive states, expansive consciousness, um, sort of the relative frameworks of time fall away. You mentioned ego dissolution at one point, um, you know, mystical experiences that happen on psychedelics. Um, do you contextualize these as transpersonal, like beyond the personal uh, um, relative identity of a human? Um, do you just contextualize them as something that happens in the imagination of ourselves? Um, do you take a Jungian view where it's more of a collective consciousness we tap into? So I'm just curious, like what your your frameworks have been and how you're you're holding that in when you ask research questions and yeah i think uh transpersonal is a is a really useful uh term um and so i like it uh, i i like um constructs and themes very much that i find in Jung jungian psychology that feel very useful and and as as stan groff realized probably more useful um well, at least as useful as Freudian constructs, because he came up with some, he discovered some real gems, you know, that, that we talk about all the time. Um, uh, but uh, Jung, you know, his contribution was massive. And so I find that very useful. Uh, I, I, I never feel any um, uh, need uh, to... Um, I don't know, diminish the experiences by saying that they're just imagination. I guess it depends depends what we're talking about here, but um, nothing is ever just imagination. It sort of makes it then seem not real. Um, and that question of what's real is a, you know, is a slippery one anyway. And things are psychologically real. I mean, if someone comes to you and says, I believe, that I transcended um, uh, the known dimensions of space and time, and uh, and and travel through another dimension or something like that. Then that's that's something that they're saying to me. But um, uh, whatever they experience, they experience and had a psychological reality. Or, or, or you know, someone with schizophrenia comes and says, you know, I I believe. X, Y, and Z is happening. Aliens from another planet are reading my thoughts, and it's psychologically real for that uh, that individual. If we want to get you know into the technicalities and break it down and look at its sort of um, you know literal reality, then we might see it's fallible on that level. Um, and if someone would say, "I feel like I've transcended these dimensions of of time and space and transcended this whatever this dimension is and then we can say okay let's let's look at the science of, of that and we may find that that it's it's actually fallible or there's not really anything there or or what what's what's offered is flimsy and sort of pseudo-scientific um and uh but i i, I see the danger of being like um Sort of de derogatory about people's experiences if ever it's said that they're 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 just imagination you know yeah i like how you use the term psychological reality um that uh, psychologically everything's real <laughs> that a person yeah. experiences if we're just yeah. looking at sort of the psychological reference point yeah. of the individual yeah it's like uh, dreams yeah i mean when you're in them you're immersed in them it's as real as anything else, you know, or you, you smoke some DMT or whatever, you go into that world, it's as real as anything else. It's, it's, it's your reality at that time. But you come out of a dream, you come out of a DMT state, you know, to then think, oh, no, that, that place does exist in some other dimension, space and time. It's an interesting creative idea, but where do we start in terms of 
you know, finding any sort of evidence for such a thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes people um, describe these experiences uh, as hyper real, you know, more, even more real than ordinary life feels real to people. Do you have a sense of what, what's under that? in terms of the the correlates of, of why something like why a dmt experience would feel more real than ordinary experience? yeah well I, I could only have a stab at it and you know so if if there are impressions there's some kind of signaling happening in the body and the brain you know maybe bottom-up signaling and we have some evidence for this we've got a paper of traveling waves in the brain which flip when you enter the DMT state, they go from a top-down direction uh, from the frontal cortex to the occipital to a bottom up from the occipital to the frontal, as if they're seeing things, you know, just like mm. what the brain does when you go from eyes closed to eyes open. Mm. Now you've got actual information, there's actual signal coming into the brain, which is driving a, an information flow up the hierarchy because there's stuff to see. And you see that under DMT. So then the question is, where's that coming from? You know? <laughs> and, uh, well, all, all the information that we have at the moment is just, well, it's coming from the back of the brain, the occipital cortex up. But then what about before that? You know, is it coming from the retina? Like it is when you open your eyes. And if it's not, where is it coming from? Well, they're the, the best evidence for inducing dreamlike experiences through electrical stimulation is in the medial temporal regions, um, the old brain, you know, the mammalian brain, uh, as Paul McLean called it, um, and, uh, and, and called it limbic system, you know, and this is a system, an old system uh, that uh, seems to engage during REM sleep dreaming. And yes, if you want to induce these dreamy states, which are actually called dreamy states in the literature, you, if you're going to stimulate anywhere in the brain, you stimulate the medial temporal regions, like the hippocampus and surrounding structures. And then, you know, not infrequently, and this is done, this has been done historically in patients with epilepsy and so on. You stimulate there, and then people have these vivid recollections. You stimulate elsewhere in the brain, and you get very different experiences you might move a limb or feel a sensation in the limb or um or um if you stimulate the visual cortex itself not much happens you might get some flashes of light so in order to you know initiate a kind of cascade of activity presumably up a hierarchy you have to stimulate the medial temporal regions so my my you know wager would be on some kind of release of medial temporal lobe activity that is propagating up into the into the visual cortex and then up the hierarchy still and and that's happening with DMT. Mm, interesting. Yeah. yeah. The, I, so in in a lot of I would say the last 15 years with the emergence of a lot of new trauma psychotherapies really coming forefront there's been a lot of language around uh dissociation and presence uh more so than probably prior in terms of like are the people we're sitting with are they dissociated or or are they present enough to integrate the material they're facing right now or are they in some kind of you know ego defense strategy or even just the brain is is really dissociating on some level and they're not present enough to deal with the overwhelm. And there's a lot of sort of tracking of physiology for that. And um, I'm curious if that framework is relevant when doing psychedelic medicine. Um, mm. You know, is this person dissociated? Does that term even mean anything on psychedelics? And um is there is it just more trusting the medicine and just helping people with overwhelming states and not worrying about their um you know level of presence to be integrating what is actually going on yeah it's a fascinating question i i wonder how 
you know, MDMA therapists would, would answer this. Uh, and MDMA therapists, you know, dealing with patients with post-traumatic stress disorder where dissociation is a, a major part of the presentation. And, um, you know, if they go back there, then, you know, back to the trauma, then a dissociative response is quite common. Um, yeah. And presumably that, you know, is less common. Um, there's more contact uh, with MDMA on board and doing MDMA therapy, which is a, a fascinating thing to try and better understand that. Um, yeah. Uh, with classics, um, I have witnessed a dissociative dissociative response which was highly atypical um in a patient in our first depression trial uh where um he sort of went offline and, and efforts to check in weren't weren't being responded to and it, you can imagine this was really disconcerting thankfully we had his you know we had the the um the physio monitoring kit by the bedside and we would check his vital signs and everything was fine um except he wasn't responding you know so it was uh it was pretty scary and uh mm -hmm. um it was you know david nutt called it maybe an elective mutism which i thought was interesting like he just decided he was he well, didn't want to know you know he was somewhere he didn't want to know and it was only afterwards he described it and it, it wasn't unpleasant is how he described it. He said it was like a sort of orgasmic experience that he was locked in and he just didn't want to be disturbed. Um, so it can, it can happen. It's highly unusual. Is it a defense mechanism? I don't, I don't know. Or a very deep immersion. You could easily construe something as a dissociation if it's a very deep immersion, let's imagine someone's on DMT, a high dose, and they, you know, you try and check in with them, and they just don't say anything. Do you call that dissociation? I'm not sure. So, yeah, it's an interesting one. With uh, with MDMA, um, we uh, at least in our phase two trial here in Boulder, we had a dissociation scale that we um, that we ran, a subjective scale, and it there were trends in the data that the more dissociation was a part of the trauma presentation, the more challenging it was to achieve um, efficacy with MDMA psychotherapy. Um, but in terms of like inside the sessions, uh, we didn't see increased dissociation with those participants per se. Uh, if anything, I think MDMA is a more of an the opposite of a dissociative it's more of an associative um, in terms of people actually feeling their physical experience in their body and being more present yeah um yeah i like that <laughs> yeah well it's yeah, also interesting because cool. ketamine obviously is a dissociative mm. uh intrinsically but yet you can do trauma work even though you're sort of technically dissociating um on ketamine so it's just an interesting thing because in let's say like emdr or somatic experiencing like you would really be working hard to help people to slow down if there's any dissociation happening and um and maybe these are different concepts i don't know i think with psychedelics it opens up kind of a rabbit hole of like what is dissociation and mm. uh psychedelics amplify so much that it's it's just maybe even a different conversation of what happens on psychedelics mm, yeah yeah if there's a collapse in in ego and ego functions then if dissociation is a is an ego function and a defense mechanism then is it is it is it sort of a valid dynamic anymore under under a psychedelic it's, a, it's an interesting mm -hmm. thought is this more just a facet of of a normal waking conscious mind and brain uh right yeah great great topic 
<laughs> well, we should wrap up. So we asked uh, this question to every guest at the end, which is <clears throat> if you had a billboard, every human would see it once in their life. There's a paragraph on it. What message would you want each person to know? Uh, message from me. Oh gosh, I, you know, I've got to play the sage now. <laughs> I don't know. You're just a, you know, a friend of mine. This is borrowing from someone else. And um, but uh, where did he get it from? Oh, the uh, what's his name? The, the English um, sort of. Um, Oh, it guy, um, man, why can't I remember his name? But it, it's this, uh, basically, hold it all lightly. In fact, that came to me once <laughs> <laughs> in the kind of context that uh, is relevant here. Hold it all lightly. Uh, yeah, hold it all lightly. And, and, and the analogy, and well, remember after we're off this call who this comes from, and others will know, um, is the idea that we're all falling. You see, and you see a this big rock and you grasp and you're you're on the big rock but you don't realize that it's falling too um but uh it's like an anti-grasping thing hold it all lightly yeah mm. okay. <laughs> beautiful thank you <laughs> thanks so much for the interview oh my pleasure